Hey everyone, it is the Jada Edwards Podcast, and today I have got the one, the only writer, author, actress, mother, wife, and dear friend, Priscilla Shire. I cannot wait to get into this conversation. <laughs> this is the Jada Edwards Podcast. Welcome to Season 5. As usual, we're going to get into the Bible and the Word of God, but we're also going to talk about friendship and overall wellness, what it means to be in various seasons of life, laugh a lot, and grow together. I can't wait for you to see what's in store. Scylla, oh my gosh. Okay, so it has taken much prayer and fasting to get on your calendar. Thank you. Thank you for visiting with us today. We are honored. I know you're not talking about anybody's calendar because you, ma'am, are doing the most in the well, most beautiful way. Oh, girl, you, I had to call the UN to clear this. I'm like, is Priscilla available? They're like, well, she's doing some peace talks, but <laughs> we, can, we can squeeze her in for you. So whatever. Yes. Yes, we're busy, but it's a good busy. It's a good yeah. busy. Okay. So I have to tell people, like, I always give a recap of who my guest is and all that. They know who you are because you're famous and all that. However, who they yeah. are to me mm-hmm. is literally one of my dearest dearest oldest friends longest friendship yeah especially as honestly I was thinking about my first friend that I met in church and it was you mm-hmm. it was yeah. you were a little aggressive we were like 11 I know you might not remember this this was Sunday school when we had children's church and you came up to me because I was new that day at church and you were like who are you and I was like uh who are you and you were like I'm Priscilla my dad's the pastor and I was I don't think I said that yeah you said that I think and uh, that I said, I'm Jada, and I'm new. You were like, I think we might be friends. And I was like, maybe. And you were like, maybe. And that was literally, I remember that conversation. I was like, this girl is crazy. And we were just the same kind of crazy. And then we just connected. And it was we probably did. to the detriment of many youth workers. <laughs> probably, because we did the most. The most. Do you remember when we appealed to try to get into high school ministry early? I we were so. like, tw- we were 12 or 13 talking about we're mature for our age. We mature through our age, and also our birthday falls at the very end of the year, so maybe it should count into the next year like a tax credit. Like as you roll over. Yes, because also we're two and a half weeks apart in December. We are. December girls. So anyway, I'm so glad to have you, girl. You've been a great friend, and it's been so cool to watch uh, just what you've done in family and life and ministry. And it's great that our friendship still has all these overlaps aside from the friendship part. So it's been yeah. been really cool. So first question out of the gate, you have been doing ministry for a very, very long time. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I think I was in grad school or finishing up college and you were like, girl, I'm on a tour. I was like, what? <laughs> like you were taking speaking engagements in college. So yes. what what has that been like over these decades of ministry? How have you seen your own self evolve and, and what is ministry looking like for you today? That's a great question, Jada. And you know what? At the time, even when you just mentioned us being in college age, grad school age, mm-hmm. in the moment, I did not realize that this 25 years later is what was happening. I didn't realize that's right. what was happening. I was just going about living my life. I was at the time pursuing a degree in broadcast journalism. I wanted to be a news anchor. That was my whole goal was to be on the news. Right. And then while I was interning at a radio station at the, while I was in the University of Houston, I interned at a radio station there. They just gave me this one hour music program. And so I'd come in like disc jockeys used to do every two or three songs. And I would say something encouraging. So people started to call the station and say, Hey, can that girl, they didn't know who I was, can that girl come in and MC something? Or can she come and lead a Bible study for my women's ministry? And so two or three times a year, I would just show up and sometimes there'd be 10 women there and I'd share a little Bible study. Sometimes I would show up because they probably thought I was a grown woman. Sometimes I would show up and there'd be 500 women there, but I'd do the same thing. I would just share a little Bible study. And so it wasn't in my mind that I'm pursuing ministry or I'm strategizing for something. Um, and then when I graduated U of H and came home, my cousin Clarice, who you know, she moved here to go to SMU. And couldn't find a Bible study. So she said to me, hey, can you come? And would you just be willing to lead a Bible study for me and my friends? So I did that for the five years. She was at SMU and there were about 10 girls that came every week, no more than 10. And I just did it for five years. I was never thinking, oh, I'm getting ready to pursue ministry. I'm strategizing. I'm trying to build something. 
I was just doing what was in front of me to do, to be honest, and still pursuing broadcast journalism at the same time, because I still thought that was going to be my career. And then to be honest, the Lord just very clearly started shutting those doors, which felt very detrimental. It was and painful. Yeah, yeah, it was we're, so yeah. painful at the time. Yeah. But then it was clear to me I, over the course of four or five years, maybe by the time I was 27, 28, 29 years old, oh, the Lord is closing these doors on purpose because he wants me to go this direction. So in hindsight, I look back and I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for your grace that was shutting doors that I was trying to force open and was making my path straight in a direction that I did not even recognize was the path you were trying to take me on for the course of my life. Love that because people, I'm sure you get this question because once you're at a certain point in your, I don't want to say career, but journey, yeah, and you will start to attract questions from people because people will say and ask me, well, how did you get started in this or how did you end up That's here? Right. And I know you get that question. And I, I love what you just shared because it's the same story that I would share and probably anybody we know, they would say, I was saying yes to this before I knew what it was. That's right. And I was being faithful in very small things. And God kind of, in his grace, accumulated all those things to bring me here. No one said, I want to apply for author. <laughs> I yeah. want to publish a Bible study. Some people do say that. And I'm saying, I think you're you're pursuing a flawed path because you're not letting the Lord incrementally build you in that skill and those small yeses over time add up. So I love it when people like you and so many people who are thriving in ministry say, oh, man, I've been doing this since I was in college. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. And and to add to that, Jada, I don't feel like what I'm doing today is more significant than what I was doing then. Ooh, that's good. That the broadness of platform or the, exactly. the method of ministry, whether it's writing or standing on a stage or or whatever, that yeah. does not make this more significant than it was when I was meeting those 10 girls over the course of five years doing a little Bible study at SMU. Right, right. It all different. matters. It's just different. Yes, yeah, right. As a matter of fact, listen, truth be told, those small Bible studies will expose all your business because you can get some amens from a thousand people. But 10 folks looking at you, they look yeah, at you like, you better be talking about something. You better be saying something because they're going to you sideways and not come back. <laughs> Girl, I did a college Bible study about a month ago and I was like, ooh, you better get your life together. These people, they, they are not here to see you. They already no. come to this Bible study, so you need to be saying, That's right. it was so good for me. Like when I get to teach with students or anything, Shh, girl, they're not playing. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so right now, what would you say is, if you look back, now that we're talking about all, you know, retrospective, because our milestone birthday is coming up. Um, I know. What is happening? Are we I don't know 12? how we got to nearly. 50. Are we almost 50? I don't know how it happened. You're sure that we're not 12 and like camp is next summer? Girl, you know how I'm sure? Because people are starting to put a handle on my name. People in their 20s are starting to say like Miss Priscilla or Auntie Mrs. Priscilla. And I'm like, you could just call me Priscilla. And then I realized, no, actually, you can't. Actually, you can't. You 20, you do have to put a handle on my name. Message to all millennial and Gen Z. We like a something before our name. Because, honey, if you 20 talking about Jada, I'm like, girl, is this somebody else in the room? Who are you talking to? You see these grays? They require Miss Ma'am or something. Auntie works. Auntie. A sign. Okay. Something. Um, so when you think back over all these years, what what would you say is like your consistent life's message, if that makes sense? Like, I feel like when I have favorite authors or favorite teachers, and I, I listen to them over and over again, you start to see themes emerge. Like, this is this person's life song like this is their message you don't matter what they teach what book of the bible what study this these handful of truths are going to come out because that's what's near and dear to them what would you say that is for you uh there are a couple of things that come to my mind but i, I think overall freedom and victory freedom mm -hmm. and victory that that you can just know the book backwards and forwards and have been in church all your life but literally not be out living mm -hmm. freedom and victory in the daily rhythms of your everyday life so galatians 5 1 was a verse that God gave me in my college years. And I remember literally like he gave it to me, like I woke up and Galatians 5.1 was on my mind. I don't ever remember memorizing it. I don't ever remember it being an intentional point of study, but it was Galatians 5.1 and I opened it up 
it is for freedom who Christ that Christ has set us free. So yeah. stand firm and don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And that verse has been ringing clearly in my head for these 25 years. And most of what I've written, whether it has to do with the armor of God, when I think about that, that's victory. That's walking in victory, walking in freedom, um, discerning the voice of God, even knowing what God is telling you so that you can have clarity and walk in the path of freedom and victory that he has assigned for you and for your life. So all of it to me in some way is tied back to that, that principle. Do you think that came from a, a season of not realizing that victory or not fully knowing what you had? For me, I grew up under your amazing father too, the one and only Tony Evans. And I remember for me, college, I call it the dark ages. I joke about it when I talk about my story. Cause I'm like, I feel like that was this season where I was like, I knew all this doing? stuff. I knew yep. all this stuff, but I was like, I am wretched. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't yeah. want to do it. And I was kind of like, mm, God, I know you're there. I still want to do what I want to do. I've been sheltered, blah, blah, blah. And I really remember a point I had to be like 22. Girl. I think I was sitting back in church. I had graduated college and came back. And I'll never forget what the Lord said. If you don't change the way you live, nobody will ever know. So there's no applause. If you don't get your life together, it's just going to be me that's disappointed. And I'm like, I'll never forget that because I knew the things. I knew the words. I knew the scripture. I knew the things. And so college for me was a turning point. Was there a point for you where you realized, I think I know these things, but I'm not actually free and victorious. That, that kind of gave birth to that message. Yes, you know, we, we are we are sisters in very many ways, Jane. In many ways. And we both know that this is one of those ways, that college years were those years where I look back on that person and don't even recognize her. Like, what were you thinking? Like, what you what in the world were you thinking? Especially, like you said, coming from the healthy family lives. Both of us had healthy marriages that we saw depicted. We had parents that walked in integrity and character. We were in a church where... Is a healthy youth group and a pastor who was teaching the word of God. So we knew all this stuff. Then we went to college and we just weren't making choices that were lining up with all the things we knew. And I also remember, you know, when the church was much, much smaller, I remember we used to have testimony service every now and then. And I remember seeing sister so-and-so uh, coming forward with her little skirt on and the back in the days where pantyhose were what you wore, not, not spanked. Yeah. In the house, full oh, living guy. Pantyhose, that's right. Waist to toe. With reinforced toe, with the real about that, she would come forward with her hat, and she would give a testimony of what God had done. You know, the little feather would be flying up there. <laughs> yes, yes, a situation. <laughs> and I remember hearing the testimony and applauding and having my faith built by those testimonies. But also, as I was celebrating that testimony, feeling like, how did she hear the voice of God that clearly? Or how did she experience God this practically? I, I don't, this something, it just was a disconnect in my mind that there was an experience that there were other, that I saw other people were having with God and I recognized I was not. And so that became a jolting place for me within those college years where I was like, you know what? I can know all this stuff till I'm blue in the face, but there has to be a practical outworking of this by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I do think from those college years, the Lord just began to, intersect my life with other believers, honestly, that were outside of our bubble from different whole streams of the church who were able to try to help me to open my eyes a little bit more to what it means to walk by the power of the spirit and not just know the truths of scripture. And that was life-changing for me. No, that is a word. That is so funny you say that. I remember in testimony service having feelings of almost jealousy like gosh I wonder what it's like to have these pivotal defining moments I think that's one of the I won't say danger it's a warning for those who you do need to raise your kids in church they do need totally. to be immersed in faith but man it can just become a blur it just becomes like this strange way of life as opposed to a decisive moment that you get when you weren't raised in church or you had to make a decision for the Lord um, it, I, that's so funny you say that. Cause I remember that. I remember feeling that often when people yeah. talk, like, what is that like to just, I, you know, we got saved when we were two, then four, then six, then eight. Like that's what happens when you're a church kid, you yeah. saved eight to six times and one of them times <laughs> stuck and you know, <laughs> so you don't remember like a before Christ and then right. came to Christ. It just was like, I just had Jesus all the time. 
and one day I actually started living like I knew him, you know? So, yeah. Um, I, that is so funny. You say that that's a poignant thought. Well, me. and I'm grateful for those people that had them testimonies because it you is fate building and it is right. jarring to hear people who get, are willing to give testimony about what God is doing in their life. And it does sober you up and cause you to reconsider and recalibrate and think about what your relationship with the Lord is doing, not in judgment or comparison to theirs, but just as a realization that there is more, that there's opportunity and invitation to go to another level of experience with God. Love that. That is true. I think when I hear you teach, I do always hear victory, understanding the power of God. Like these are themes that, that I think are, they ring true. And I think it's good for people to hear that those things come from a place. It's not trying to yeah. meet the needs of the audience at that moment. You're like, um, this is what, it don't matter what I teach somehow, this is where I'm going to end up landing. And so this is, this is true to who I am. That, that is awesome. Okay. So speaking of the ministry journey and career, you are a whole actress, like and like, and you're, you have a new movie coming out. Aren't you playing like three or four people or something? No, you're always exaggerating stuff. Me? It's just two people. Ma'am, that's still more than yourself. Yes. Literally was like, did she tell me this? Because when we were talking about this many months ago, I, I, I was like on social media going, I don't remember a conversation where she was like, I'm playing two people in this movie. I was really trying to recall, girl. You I, are you trying to get an Oscar? No, 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 no. Let me write your no. name in. I'm still confused as to how this happened. How you became and a whole actress? Who accidentally becomes an actress? I'm Priscilla. serious. I'm I'm still confused about it. But you know what? To be honest with you, talking about looking back retrospectively and nostalgic about life. When I think about it, most of it I'm surprised about. You would probably say the same thing. I'm serious. Like when you right. look at the church the Lord has entrusted to you at Conway, when you look at the ministry he's entrusted to you outside of your local church, when you look at the path of your life, if most of it is kind of jarring. Like, Lord, I can't even believe, number one, you're letting me partner with you like this because you know me. You, you know my deficiencies and weaknesses. But also, I'm not trained for this or skilled for that or I didn't plan for this. So that's one of the opportunities of ministry that's that's the way I look at it I don't look at it at it like now I'm an actress I look at it just like the same with writing a publisher came to me and said hey we heard this message that you spoke would you be interested in writing and I said no I'm not an author and they said I, I think you can just just pray about it and see it's the same thing that happened with War Room was the first film the the directors were writing the script and they were thinking as they were writing the parts for Elizabeth Jordan they told me later they were thinking, well, what would Priscilla Shire say here? And so then they didn't, we didn't know each other personally at that point. We'd only met once, but I think their wives had done Bible studies or something. That isn't, yeah. yeah. So they were thinking it. And then they, after they finished the script, they just called and said, would you consider actually doing this? And they said, we don't know if you can act. You'd, you'd still have to put something on video for us to see if it would actually work. Cause you know, it matters that it works, but would you consider it? And I remember saying the same thing I did about writing. I said, no. Are y'all crazy? Like, because we've all seen movies before that could have been good, but there was that one actress that just... Somebody what? didn't tell the truth. Her That's friends right. did not tell her she right. can't. And at those you points... Like, you must have had me on this screen looking girl, crazy. I was like, mm -mm, y'all not... I'm not going to mess up, because at that point, these men had done Facing the Giants, Courageous, that were substantial movies that people right. enjoyed and had edified the body of Christ. So I was like, oh no, y'all... I, in fact, I texted them a list of names of other black women who were actresses that I admire. And I was like, some recommendations. Oh, yeah. Yes. And they just said, we actually really feel like the Lord um, has put you on our heart. Would you at least read the script? And would you pray about it? And um, I read the script and realized that, as they said, they said, we think you'll see it's not just a movie. It is ministry. It's ministry. And when I read the script for War Room, I was like, that's ministry. Yeah. And the same thing with this next film, which is called um, The Forge. It is not necessarily a part two of War Room, but it kind of is. It's there's the worlds collide with the War Room world. And it is about discipleship. It is about a single mother of a young boy, um, which, you know, was near and dear to my heart because I have three three sons that are the same age as this young man in this film. And he's just floundering and trying to find his way. 
and this single mother is praying that the Lord would send some sort of, uh, of godly male influence into his life. And he meets a businessman. And I love the writing of this because it's not a preacher, not somebody in vocational ministry. He meets a successful CEO of a business. And that man, part of his ministry is that while he does business in excellence, his eyes are always looking across the landscape of his employee pool to see what young man the Lord is going to bring into his life that he can disciple and help them get their life on track um, in a number of different ways. And so it's just, to me, the acting part, it's just another opportunity the Lord has given me to do ministry in a way that I would have never imagined. Listen, I'm so proud of you. And I, I want people to hear that. I think we, I think our culture today, I won't, I won't pin it to a certain generation, but I'll say in general, our culture today is very aspirational. Yeah. Even within Christianity. Totally. And I think it's a tool of the enemy to totally. kind of cloud it or shroud it as godly ambition. I want to do big things for the Lord because there's just not anybody in scripture that God has used greatly that wanted great things. They all were like, I don't know about this God. All right. No. And he was like, I know you don't know. And I actually want to take your insecurity and your doubt and your weakness, blah, blah, blah. And it's going to be me. And so I love when when you when you're sharing because people need to know that these weren't things you aspired to right it was just the yes and is this in line with my ministry does this make sense with what god is asking me to do even to the point where you're like let me give you some other recommendations i don't know how many people would get that opportunity and say okay but i had six people who could really kill it um because <laughs> we would say oh I, I, it must be for me and so i think it's that humility honestly priscilla um there's a there's a self-deprecation you have this just kind of like surely you you don't you don't mean me and I think God has honored it in addition obviously to your gifts but I I want people to hear that um the, where you are in life however it's seen by people wasn't something that was in your you know senior yearbook or some <laughs> aspirational thing you just kind of walked in it and um I appreciate I really appreciate that about you I really really do I don't know if we still be friends if you start feeling yourself but you know, we still keep it real. I mean, she's very humble, y'all. That's why we still, she's very, she has a lot of gorgeous hair, but still very humble. <laughs> okay, you talked about your boys. I wanted to ask you about that, actually. That was on one of my questions. I actually had some questions. You've now got two in college. Yes. And the handsome Jude, you know, he kind of, mm, he's so cute. Almost, he's getting there. But now that you've got boys in college, I was literally thinking about this this morning, girl, thinking about our college years after all of our Jesus immersion. We still had to act a fool a little bit. Mm -hmm. man. What is your prayer or concern or thoughts now that your boys, even though they're at a Christian school, it's still an exploratory phase without your parents' faith safety net right there. You know, how have you been thinking about that? Well, <laughs> Mostly, when I'm thinking about them and particularly praying for them, I am asking the Lord to sever every illegitimate influence and relationship Ooh. and to replace it with the kinds of people, mm. whether coaches, um, professors, or peer group that are actually going to keep them encouraged and are going to help to steer them towards God's purposes for them life. Because here's what I know. Half the battle is relationships. Who are you telling? Hanging out with fools. Make sure hanging out with fools. You could be the I'm best. The Bible says best intentions. Yep, yep. Sever so I've been trying to get them relationship. That's to good. realize that just because someone is in your sphere, like you know, because the older two are athletes and Jude is too, but when they went to college, you know, you're literally put into a dorm room situation with the other athletes. It, it's just so, or you know, if you're a defensive end position, all the other guys in your position. Well, you're going to be with them 24 seven. Y'all working out together. You eat together. You do all the things. So you could make the assumption that because I've been put in there in the, the proximity of them, that they are my people. But that don't mean that you're going to have to take a minute to you pause and see that their character is. Are y'all, do y'all actually, are you headed in the same direction at all? Are they participating in activities that, you know, doggone good and well? are not going to serve you well, whether physically or mentally or emotionally. So you're going to have to be willing to separate yourself from people who are in proximity, but they are not your people. And that takes a minute to try to figure out when you're 20 and you just want to kind of 
enjoy your enjoy yourself with the people that are around you. Mothers, that's the prayer. Every season, totally sever every illegitimate relationship. That's okay. great. That's Remove great. them out of my son's life. Yeah, and and the Lord has been faithful in that because you've told me about a coach that you love and how they have found some good mentorship there. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome, girl. I love it. I I'm just like, gosh, what will I do with my kids? college lord girl your kids are getting big and they're so they're just so sweet they're so, joe is smile it's too much i just want to grab his whole cheek situation he does have a lot of cheeks he's, he does yeah, he's a cutie pie. yeah and so we had our kids big. on opposite ends of the spectrum how long were y'all married before you before you before jackson her son was born four years in yeah it was short you know ours was like 13 years in. i know hence I know. the age gaps that's right <laughs> but yes Got an elementary kid and a middle schooler and girl. It is so funny to me watch them watch them get older. But I I do still think about college and all that. I feel like those years just go by. Oh yes, and it comes very quick, Jader. Yes, I know, mm-hmm. I know. What's it like now? You kind of got an only child situation with your I youngest. Do. But I will say we haven't really experienced it yet because we have a bonus son named Chris That's who's here him. all the time. Like when mm-hmm. I say all the time. He'll come over to visit, and four months later, he's just <laughs> still here. Just, and it's been the best thing because he's about five years older than my oldest son. So it's been like for them, it's like having a big brother who's just all up on him. And you know, Chris Smith is such a yes. good man. Yeah. So having him around is a blessing to me. So I just make extra food, and I'll notice in the morning is the extra person just coming down from from upstairs. So he's been around, and then you know, my sweet niece Alina. Um, after she graduated from high school, she moved in with us for a year. She just moved back to Nashville, but she was here. So Jude, it's been great for my youngest son because it's not like he transitioned to just, just him and his pants, which would be yeah. dreadful for a 15 year old. He's had some other people to buff the situation. Right, right, right. So thinking about family and the evolution of marriage and you know, now that we're 20 plus years in, I am grateful for our parents' longevity. Mm-hmm. I am grateful that they had a million years of marriage because I think that sets you up, obviously, for a certain level yeah. of success. I wish now, and it's not a knock on my parents, they did what they did, yeah. right? I wish there had been more transparent conversations about how like staying together is not the end goal. Like you right. it takes different tools to thrive at different seasons. Does that make sense? And so, yeah. what has it been like now? You've got two kids out of the house. Obviously, that's going to be even more time for you and Jerry, my brother, Jay Shy. Um, what's that been like for you as you're learning? Oh, I kind of got to relearn what this marriage is like now with with less logistics and more time together. What does that look for like? Look like I mean, for real, because I'm yeah. looking like, bro, check, listen, not now, not today, bro. Not today. <laughs> not playing with you. <laughs> I love you. But leave me alone. I know. Well, part, you know what? Jerry said this girl. It was so funny at the time. But he looked at me when the house was a little quieter and we had a little margin in our time and everything. He looked over at me and he's like, I just realized I like you. It's the kids I didn't like. <laughs> yes, they were the causing point. all the tension in this family. <laughs> And the, it, it kind of is true with all the, just the logistics. It's not yes. them as people sometimes. Yes. It's the logistics They're of lives. navigating behavioral difficulties, you know, the, the schedules that. It, so you're just exhausted because you just pass it in the night trying to make things work. Yeah. And then you do look up one day and go, OK, here we are. Here we are. And you so know. we have tried to intentionally go, OK, what are the things we enjoy? Do we even know what we enjoy? Yeah. Let's do those things. Let's talk about what those are and let's do those things. And then what are the things that each of us enjoy as individuals that maybe we've lost in the shuffle of the busyness of the past 20 years? Let's support each other and give each other the margin to do those things by ourselves that we want to do. Um, So just kind of coming back to a intentional conversation, which we've had many of them about what do we like and what do we want to spend our time doing? And I'll tell you, one of the things I learned from mom, Jada, um, you know, really, she said this to us in some form or fashion our whole life, but you don't know what you're hearing when you're 21, you know. <laughs> yeah. But but then in her last year of life, we, you know, we had a lot of co- deep, sobering conversations. And one of the things she said over and over again was, you kids have got to stop and smell the roses. 
And basically, as she would talk more, what she was trying to say was she waited too late in life to just enjoy it. So I'm telling you what, I don't know what happened after mom uh, passed away and went to heaven, but it's like the spirit of Lois uh, fell heavy on me. You have a no in your spirit. For some reason, you, uh -uh. Mm -mm. are you busy? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Doing yeah, nothing. I, I have Just... no desire to do the most for doing the most sake. I want to know what, Lord, have you called me to do? I want to do yes. that. And then I want to know, Lord, what are the passions, the interests, the things that in this season bring me joy? And I also want to do that. I, I don't want to always have something pressing on me that I have to complete, projects that have to be done, things that have to fill up my time and all my margins so that there's no opportunity to just do what my mom encouraged me to do, stop and smell the roses. And so she did get a lot of years to be able to do that. But in hindsight, she wished she would have started that mode of thinking and perspective about life sooner. Enjoy it. Word. That's a good so word. I think Jerry and I are trying to figure that out now together. How can, what do we need to do to just enjoy the ride a little bit and just enjoy one another and enjoy the gifts and talents or abilities or passions, interests that God has given us uniquely? Yeah, I I love that because it really speaks to, in essence, it's speaking to intentionality. And I think in, you can be in Christian spaces and it's so much emphasis on not divorcing and staying together That's that true. they don't really equip you how to enjoy and thrive. Like just staying married is not God's greatest call for your marriage. And so yeah. if you're married, you know, intentionality, if you've got littles at home or folks, kids still at home, Try it now, even bite size, because I think it's so important. Totally. And you need to like the person. Listen, he if he or she is godly and loves Jesus and quotes scripture and y'all don't like each other. Y'all need to be friends. Unless all y'all doing is Bible study. <laughs> then you need to like. Listen, this is need a to conversation. Laugh. Because I'm like, you, yes, you need to laugh. Also, you need to be attracted to this person. This Girl. is someone you are going to have to actually sleep with for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Waking up so, every morning. To Girl, sometimes I'm like, we're so godly about it. And yes, we need to think of spiritual realities. That is so important. And women, you need to make sure he actually is a leader and has a little vision and yeah. is, is tactful with his finances. And of course, there are all those logistics. But also, you need to make sure that you have fun with this person and that you are attracted to him. And that he, when you look at him, you like, I'm ready. That's my book. Right. Yes. No, that was level six truth. matter too. Absolutely. I was I was just telling someone, I said, I I Conway still impresses me. And yeah. not even just attractive. He still says things, does things, stuff comes out of his brain. And I'm like, that boy is smart. That's He's smart. 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 If your spouse doesn't uh, impress you in some ears, like they do in a thing way. that yeah. you just cannot figure out, I could never do that. Like they have to have a thing. I don't care what it is. It's yes. got to be something that makes you go, you good. Yeah. I'm glad you mind. You know. And can, you uh, know what? Can we just pause? I'm totally interrupting you so we can pause because I just don't know if people also know. This is one of the things about our history that has shocked me too. Conway was at Dallas Theological Seminary with me. We were seminary students together. He was right. in this part of my life. We were, we knew each other. We weren't great friends. Like we didn't know each other intimately, personally. We weren't having a little right. together all the time. But we were in class together. I knew Conway. And you were a part of my life over here with a group of friends that is totally disconnected from seminary. So how in the world the two of y'all met that one night at some party we were at at a friend's house and y'all happened to be there. And I remember hours into the night, I look outside and the two of y'all are talking. And I was like, well, that's nice. Jaden and Conway met. Right. And now all these years later mm -hmm. to see that the Lord brought y'all together like that, that is mind blowing to I me. Know. I know it is because you're always like, what? I know. Girl, it's your daddy's fault. He brought him on to be this pastoral assistant. And when Conway first expressed interest, your dad, you know, he has the most random memory. Okay, we had had a conversation. I had to be a young teen, like 15, 16, talking about, I don't even know what I'm, I was talking about missions and what I wanted in a husband. I don't know why we were having this conversation. Fast forward to my early 20s. He was like, I'd never forget. He sat me down. He said, this is the one. Remember, you said you wanted somebody who loved Jesus and all evangelists. <laughs> like, this is that have not met Conway. I don't think yes. I remember. And this. your dad was like, you don't remember we talked about this? Wow. I said, no. And why do you remember? 
He was like, this is it. I said, but he don't have no money. <laughs> Can't we love Jesus? When Dr. Tony Evans looks at you and says, this is it. Listen, you had to follow to the degree that your dad called my dad. Like, my dad will tell you today that his talk with Pastor was one of the deciding factors. Because, you know, Jay was like, he loves Jesus without no money. We can't get no dollar signs with mm -hmm. Jesus. Jay's not about that life. He's not about that life, okay? He about that vacation life. So, Conway was like, you know, we're going to have a staycation. He's like, mm -mm. where can you take my daughter? So, oh, yes, yeah. one of the most practical, get her line, frugal. He is your father. Stand. He is my father. Did you hear me? He is your father. I, and see, and Jerry, Jerry is my guy. Me and Jerry are like, no. let's have the things. Let's live yeah. it. Y'all well, love business Jesus. people, business-minded, yes. want to serve yes. the Lord, but you, you got a whole other and, morning part working over here. That's right. That's right. Me You're and Conway are just skipping through the ministry part over right. here. With y'all's handwritten note papers talking about where's my that's notes. Right. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I have to tell on you, everybody, because y'all, you know, Jerry called me before this call. Like, no, no, no. You know, my wife is set up for this technology. But is she not technology? I said, I know. She's my husband. <laughs> You're right. Like, yeah. I have it set up to hit one button. I was like, oh, Lord. Jesus. I know. I think that people think, you know, we'll get calls for podcasts or video things and all this. I think people think we have a studio over here and I have microphones and lights. And, you yeah, know, I'm like, I'm trying to get this office button. with a ring light and a, and a computer that Jerry set up. Right. right. And Jerry, like, don't touch nothing. <laughs> when she starts, just hit this. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here's my last question, and it's kind of deep. But I know I, 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 your perspective on this, because we've had so many conversations about it, I think is so valuable for people. I think that as believers, we know in our head, God is sovereign, God is good. When hard things come, we kind of we mm -hmm. use our faith talk to be like, God is good, he's still in control. What, but what happens when life really is life -y, right mm -hmm. and i'm thinking about the last several years of your life a lot of loss mm -hmm. some close i'm thinking about the season we're in with our own friends loss yes. parents siblings unexpected some some end of life natural things some unexpected things what has that been like for you in your own faith journey to get away from the cliche of god is good and god is sovereign and to feel all the things, the hurt, the anger, the grief, and still come to this conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah. What, what has that been like for you? Well, oh my gosh, so many. I know, I turned the corner. Just, I know. I know. So many things just sparked in my mind while you were asking them. But one of them, but probably the primary things, is that can't nobody tell me that the Holy Spirit is not real. Mm -hmm. I could have said it before. Yeah. I know for sure now. And it's not only because of the way he sustained me through it, but it's honestly because of watching my daddy. Mm. Anybody that can oh. lose your brother, your sister, your father, your wife 30 days after that, a niece, it was literally like watching Joan. Yeah. And then in the middle of all that, three months after mom died, the church also died in a sense with 2020 when the church closed. And you know, for a Conway, for a Dr. Evans, not being able to go to church is like another grief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's another loss. Absolutely. So I watched my dad go through staggering, outrageous loss. It literally felt like watching Job, like the Lord just kind of snatching things, um, allowing things to be snatched away. And for that man to get up and keep functioning, I'm talking about in the most basic of ways, to watch him be able to put on clothes, to be able to function as a father, play around with his grandkids, show up at church and still preach, still have something to say about God and his faith and Anybody that can do that, some people have been through much less and literally cannot function anymore. They cannot mentally and emotionally um, continue to show up for their life. So watching it in my dad is proof to me that the Holy Spirit is real. Just as much of a miracle as it would have been for the Lord to heal our mom, for example, that is an equal miracle to sustaining somebody who Stains. remains yes. after so much loss has happened. Yeah, I want my sons to have of me the same testimony I have of my daddy. Ooh, that, that's what I want. I want my boys to be Good able to girl. tell my grandchildren. Yeah, mom, mom believed in God even when things were bad. It wasn't just when things were going well that mom told us that God is good and we learned the scriptures and, you know, she rejoiced and that sort of thing. But even when stuff was hard, mom cried all the tears and she was sad, but she did not 
turn her back on the God she believed when she was on the mountaintop. I, I so want that to be the legacy of faith that I leave for my kids because I have seen it now in my father. So to answer your question, that one reality has sobered me up so much that the Holy Spirit got to be real. And anybody that does not have him, I do not know how you would make it from point A to point B in your life. Not with life out of your life and the way this life is out of your life. <laughs> On a corporate macro level with just stuff we see happening in culture and in the world and politics and money and all the things, stock markets and all that. But on the micro level, like you said, people have tough stuff happening, abusive things and heartbreaking things and kids that you've raised a certain way. And then they live in a completely different way that is out of alignment with what you spent your life investing. You get that kind of disappointment going if you don't have something supernatural, honestly, to get you up out of bed in the morning, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. So I've learned that. And I've also learned, and not to over-spiritualize it, but honestly, I've also learned that God's grace is sufficient. That it really is, that his grace is not just a saving grace, it is a sustaining grace. That he'll give you grace to walk through the seasons and grace to ask all the hard questions, grace to cry the tears, grace to shake your fist in his face and say, God, I'm a little bit mad about this because you could have done this situation differently and you didn't, and I don't understand why. He's big enough to handle the questions. And I can ask questions of God without questioning God. That's it right there. If that makes sense. Like, yes, his grace is sufficient sense. for all my little questions. He knows I'm frail and human and I'm disappointed and frustrated. And he knows it anyway. So yeah. the fact he's let me ask all my questions and cry all my tears and my, you know, my, all of our family members doing that. You and I have done that, Jada, with loved ones of ours in our lives that have gone through hard things or we've been through hard things in, in our personal lives, he lets us cry all the tears and he says, come, come with all that stuff. My grace is sufficient. I got you. And you can do all of that and still know that he's trustworthy, that he's got my back and that the same God who started this work in me, he is going to complete it. So I still believe that and I'm confident in that because um, I've seen it now to be true through the just the past five years of what we've been through. I know for sure it is true. His grace is sufficient. That's so good. So that, oh my gosh, that's so good. And <laughs> have you found, I wish it didn't have to be this way, but have you found that how you seek God, what you know of God, your connectedness to God is so different in the valley places? Like, I, I wish I could love God on the mountain. I wish that I could, I think I'm loving God when I just, been promoted or achieved a success, but then I realized in the low place, I'm like, oh, I wouldn't love. Oh, I just I wasn't high five. Enough. I was kind of high fiving God, but now in the low place, all the names Jehovah, Sid Canoe, Nisi, Rop. I'm like, it's just you just know him differently. You know him differently, and you're grateful in a different way. Um, you know, mm. we, we laugh at our mothers and our grandmothers who just, you know, riding down the street would just say things like, Lord, I thank you. And mm. you would just be like, girl, Beck for what? For what? We're just driving down the street. <laughs> just, it, we had but now you get it. You you got yes. through another day without major heartache or tragedy. Your kids are safe at the end of the day. Everybody's all right. You, things went semi-decent. You are like, yeah. thank you, Lord. Because I know that is only the restraining hand of God himself that held back evil from my life all day long today. So you get it at a certain point. So your level of, of gratitude, I think, goes up for the way he sustained you. Even, not to go back to this too much, but even with all the losses we face, I could be so mad and frustrated and upset that he allowed my mom or whatever to be taken away. Or I could be so grateful that I had her for all them years, because I know some young some people, years. Yeah. like Alina, who lost yeah. Winter, her mother, yeah. one of my best friends, my cousin, lost her. Alina was 14 years old then. I can't even so believe it. Yeah. Who yeah. am yeah. I to be mad that the Lord, you know, uh, allowed sickness to take my mother to heaven when she was 70 and I was 45? Lord, thank you that I had my mom until yeah. I was 45. Yeah. What grace and gratitude that you gave yeah. me that much time with her. I have so much gratitude for that. So yeah. it does shift your perspective, Jada. It shifts your relationship with the Lord. And um, for me, it just makes me more grateful for every day that he gives us where we make it to the end of the day and everything's all right. It's like, you know what, Lord, I thank you. Cause I know it's your grace that did it. It's gone different. 
We sound like mothers of the church. Honey. Listen, I'll be like, I'll call my grandmother who'll be 98 this year. And she's like, and I'll be like, granny, how's your day going? Well, you know, I just thank God for salvation. He's the giver of long life. I'm like, yes, he is. But also how is rehab? Oh, well, you know, they, they doing what they do. But listen, the Lord is my rock and my refuge. I'm like, okay. Granny. And now I'm like, you know what? Sometimes that's all you got to say. I, I'm getting closer to that than I was a few years ago where I'm just like, all right. Because the truth is, it hurts. Rehab yeah. hurts, whether it's physical rehab, emotional rehab, mental rehab. It's exhausting. Yes. It hurts. It you does. don't want to do it. You don't want to show up for it. So sometimes you don't have anything good to say. Yeah. Except the Lord is my God. Rock. The Lord is my Girl. rock. And you know what I want to say to anybody that's, you know, listening to our conversation and they are in a season of suffering and heartache. Man, Jada, I would encourage them to go grab anything or listen to any video that they might find on YouTube by Catherine Wolf. And I know that yeah. you're familiar with Catherine. Yeah. But this woman experienced a jarring, um, life-changing event. Yeah. She had a stroke in her 20s. Yeah. yeah. Just she starting out in marriage with a brand new baby, and she has a stroke, and it has totally and irreparably changed the whole course of her, her life. She lives in constant pain. And to listen to that woman with her slurred speech now that you know her entire structure has changed to listen to her talk about the westernized modernized view of what it means to follow christ that has excluded suffering and has presented it as some sort of life of ease and comfort that is a mark yeah. in god's favor and yeah. for her to talk to you from her vantage point yeah about what it, it means to be in the fellowship of his suffering mm -hmm. that's it. it makes you stop complaining right that's away it. and realize that god is good right you're like what am i talking about traffic for what's happening yeah. No, she's phenomenal. And she's, phenomenal. she is a great, her story, her testimony, not just in a past perspective, but what she's living today is just yeah. amazing. Yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Last question is fun. Anything on your bucket list? Like I said, we're hitting this milestone, girl. Uh, what? Anything you just want to do that's fun that you like, okay, I just want to do this thing or try this thing before the Lord takes me home. Ooh. I, I mean, to be honest with you, be in your pajamas. <laughs> Girl, don't play with me because you know oh, the answer is yes. I know. Exactly. Still a space I, thing. I feel like I've had such an adventure throughout the course of yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, just I've had the opportunity to, to travel and ministry. And so even with my mom's encouragement, I've made it a point to kind of tack on a couple of days when I'm in a place where I might not ever go again, just so I can experience that. So honestly, I feel like I've gotten to do a couple bucket list kind of things already. The bucket list for me now is getting to see my sons excel, whatever that means to see them come into manhood and be men of integrity with, with some character and a compass for their life and hopefully meet a girl who I like. Hey, cause we, cause girl, let me tell you something. That's the prayer right now. I'm like, Lord, don't bring no, listen, don't just bring anybody home. I know. In don't the name of Jesus, she will still get the side eye. You know what? She really will. And I, she my will. whole, I've been praying about my heart ain't right already. Like I already have an attitude and I don't even know who these women are. And for the so, unknown woman. The unknown woman. So I've been praying, Lord, prepare my heart. And the Lord, please bring women into my my husband's, my son's lives that are mm -hmm. going to just make them feel like the leaders that they are, going to give them encouragement and support that aren't going to be high maintenance so that my sons feel like they're constantly having to win their approval all the time. But but let me see them enjoy a marriage to somebody that will make their lives even more fruitful. And then prayerfully see some little grandbabies come along the way. Like that's bucket list stuff to me. Yeah. Just see the fruit of the investment yeah. that Jerry and I have made in these boys for the past 20, 22 years now. Yeah. That's a good bucket list. That's girl. what I want to All that comes with long life. Watching, that's right. Watching the fruit of your labor. <laughs> that's right. By the yeah. grace of God. Girl, well, I want to thank you. I really wanted to talk more about friendship. But once I go back to the UN and get a second date on your schedule, maybe for 2027, We'll talk more about You're it. Way busier than me, Jada. You do know that, right? We don't have a lot going on. Sis. Girl, why are you going to lie to the people? You on the podcast. You on your podcast. <laughs> you run a whole church with your husband. That's not a small church. You have lots of needs and lots of people. You do a podcast. You work a full-time job. You are mothering two children and you are the wife to a very high intensity man. You have 18 full-time jobs, ma'am. You know, in Jamaican terms, that's like one. 
So, you know, and <laughs> I am very much married to a Jamaican. So, uh, but I do want to talk about that. I get a lot of questions about that. We're going to, we are for real going to talk about it because I get a lot of people and this, we're going to end because I know it's going to go, I would go forever. But I think because of we're, you know, our device centric culture here. Yeah. I get a lot of women, I mean, in their twenties and thirties and they do not know how to forge friendships, you know? Um, and so I get a lot of questions like, how do you find good friends? How do you make good friends? The way we interact in community is so different. It's not go outside. Yeah. It's not youth group. Cool. So that's a whole thing. Like I've been trying to really yes. help women form good friendships, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but I do want to say thank you. And I thank love you. you. You're an I amazing you. woman and friend. And so uh, I'm glad that our audience is going to get to know you a little bit better. And y'all go see The Forge. That's what it's called, right? It's called The Forge. And it'll be out in August. So you have a little time. Yeah, we have a little time and we'll send a little reminder because Priscilla plays triplets or something amazing. She does something super cool in the movie and it's going to be amazing. Well, right I in. Jada, I admire you so much in so many ways. And, you know, I tell you this when we're not on video with a microphone. Yes. Yes. I admire you in for many reasons, but I appreciate you and I love you with my whole heart. I love you. Love you. Grateful for this friendship. Grateful, grateful. We're going to be old one day. Sit on the porch talking about everybody with all this. Yes. We are like, I don't know why she did that. We could have told her. So y'all catch us in 10 more years. The filter is decreasing. We just say whatever. Yeah. You <laughs> Thank you, girl. I love you. Love you too. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, make sure to leave a comment, leave a review, share, subscribe, all the things. And we'll catch you next time.